I'm just going to read um, a part of my memoir. It's called Becoming a Pastor's Kid. It was so darn early in the morning. I just wanted to sleep in. It was hard to get in, to rest in the morning since I shared a bed with my parents, sister, and young brother. They always woke up on time, got dressed and prepared in an orderly fashion, and even had time to eat breakfast. I hated it most that my mom and dad would wake me up at the very last minute and rush me to get ready at their speedy pace. Heck, I was only six years old and this was a lot of pressure for me. Every Sunday morning, our tiny home at 426, located at the corner of Concordia and Western, in the public housing of Liberty Plaza, was joyfully echoed by sounds of the 70s, mainly including disco. I will never forget hearing my dad attempt at karaoke to cool in the games. Celebrate good times, come on. Although I was half asleep, I could still hear my dad's strong Asian accent, accent singing fade in and out of my consciousness. What was most interesting about this recollection is that neither of my parents barely understood English, yet they were so in tune with the trendy American music in that time. It was impressive that language definitely was not going to be the barrier in enjoying music. More amazing was the journey of finding their faith as they would drag us to, to, drag us to this boring American church every Sunday, not knowing the language at all, but having the desire to understand the teachings and messages that were being shared. My energy was at its lowest, which added to my reason of not wanting to get dressed and to go to church. I was restless. I must have experienced plenty of dreams that night before. If not my own, then I must have been in someone else's dream, so I heard and felt like I was a part of it. My parents were first generation immigrants to the States. At that time, I didn't know that we were poor. I just thought that we all slept in the same bed because my parents missed us during the day. I later learned that although we had other bedrooms in the house, we didn't have beds to furnish them, and that was told by one of my friends from church. I knew I didn't want to go to this place where no one looked like me. Everyone was white. All the girls had perfect looking blonde hair with ribbons tied in it and wore beautiful dresses every Sunday. My sister and I alternated our three dresses every third Sunday and I thought we were pretty lucky. As I was driving and preparing for another Sunday, something inside of me, some might call it curiosity, others call it courage, had the nerve to question my father. Dad, when can we stop going to church? Just like the movies, this was the part where he turned the music down while still tying his tie, walked over to where I was sitting and said, look at me, we will go to church until the day we die. At this point, I knew that he meant what he said and that I should never ask him again. I then hurried out of bed and went over to where my dress was laid out for me. I looked over at my sister and realized that it was the same one that she had on. My mom always bought us the same dresses and always made us wear them at the same time, as if we were twins. This particular Sunday, we wore our red and gold striped dresses that had a bright red apple stitched to the left-hand corner. Both my sister and I were proud of this dress. This was the same dress that I took my kindergarten pictures in. After I got dressed, my mom brushed my long and thick hair, parted it, and tied them into two pigtails. My hair was so rich, unlike my sister's, who had only a few strands, not even enough to put in a single ponytail. She got to wear her hair down always, which made me jealous at times because I wanted my hair to be loose and blow in the wind as well. At nighttime, when I would take my pigtails out, I almost always had headaches from the heaviness of my hair. I began to hate my hair, but my parents never allowed for even a trim. They persuaded me that girls with long hair were more likely to have good fortune and would later on find a good husband. I didn't know what the truth was. I, was. I only knew what my parents told me, and their reasoning was persuasive enough for a six-year-old not to debate about having long hair. Sundays at church were quite boring. I knew limited English. I knew enough to get me by with Bible readings and lessons, as long as Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Moses, and the 12 disciples were involved. All other biblical names were easily forgotten as soon as they were pronounced. The sanctuary or Sunday worship was where I got lost, Pastor James' preaching was too fast for a six-year-old to comprehend. Although my mom really wanted to be there, every time I glanced over at her, her eyes were shut and her head was involuntarily nodding. Either it was a long individual prayer or she was falling asleep. I thought it was strange that after worship, while other families got to leave, go eat lunch, or return home, 
It was my family who would stay after and clean the church up. I knew we didn't have a lot of money, but I also knew that my parents did perform this type of labor in their homeland as a living. I sensed that something was wrong. This was about two and a half decades before I even knew that items such as race, class, and gender issues existed. But I knew that it was strange since we always clean the church on Sundays. My parents felt that it was a privilege to have this opportunity. I was always in charge of cleaning the women's bathrooms, of which I hated the smell of the cleaning agents. Years would pass, and as these Sundays seemed to have repeated, more and more Hmong families also started immigrating to the Twin Cities. My parents quickly recruited them into attending our church and becoming members. After about five years, there were at least 30 Hmong families as members. At this point, my father was, quote unquote, climbing the corporate ladder, as a few years later, my father was approached by the white pastor and deacons and asked if he was interested in becoming a Hmong pastor for the Hmong congregation. My father kindly and gladly accepted this appointment. This was the beginning of a new life for my father as a preacher, for my mother as the preacher's wife, and for all of us children, the preacher's kids. This meant no absences in Sunday school, choir practices on Saturday mornings, and being dressed up every Sunday and being nice to everyone, even if it was fake. This also meant being invited to numerous events, royalty-like treatment in public, free food, and endless gifts at Hmong festivals, and being honored within the Hmong community. It was kind of similar to the President of the United States lifestyle, but on a much smaller scale. You know how they say that pastor's kids are the worst? Well, it's more true than not. I have a lot of friends who are pastor's kids, and we all know that it was a hard role to live. I was un always under the microscope. Everything that I did was reported back to my parents. Well, let me take that back. Everything bad that I did was reported back. I was dealing with more than just the fact that my father was a pastor. My parents were the f first Hmong generation immigrated to this country. They were in a whole new world raising Hmong kids in an American society. They were raised with a religion known as shamanism while trying to learn, live, and teach us about the Judeo-Christian faith. There were language barriers. The list can be dissected and continues. Needless to say, these issues altogether have created the formula to my complex childhood, youth, and currently my adult life. Thank you.